let's get back in the Mikolas connection to Tezcatlipoca. Tezcatlipoca has a close association to whirling things, like tornadoes, whirlpools, and hurricanes. Tezcatlipoca's Teol may be that in which moves these phenomena. He is the god of all directions. This includes the whirling of the sky and its stars. At the center of the celestial whirling is the pole stars, the body of Tezcatlipoca. There are spirals aplenty within the lands between, like Whirl of Flame, Swarmblade, Zamor Ice Storm, and Rock Blaster. These are spirals of nature, as all elements are represented, fire, air, water, and earth. Natural spirals are also displayed via the tornado that surrounds Farmazula and the multitude of whirlpools found within the seas that surround the lands between. Spirals are important as they can symbolize the continuation of life, a symbol of causality. Causality is the principle of cause and effect. Golden Order fundamentalists describe it as the pull between meanings, that which links all things in a chain of relation. I believe this chain of relation represents DNA, a wondrous molecule with a unique capability of reproducing itself. Only DNA, and no other molecule, carries the ability to copy and then pass heritable information to subsequent generations. DNA is the essence of life itself. Your DNA sequence determines how susceptible you are to health-related conditions. Scientists study these sequences to modify genes or replace faulty genes with healthy ones to treat, cure, or prevent a disease. Mikola abandoned fundamentalism for it could do nothing to treat Melania's accursed rot. Melania's rot is a representation of how the lands between have become stagnated since the removal of destined death. The search for his sister's cure was Mikola's first step to desire godhood, matching the ambition of his father, Radagon. As the only way to create the change necessary in healing his sister and the lands between overall of its stagnation is to stage a grand rebirth, to become the creator. Albeit speculation, I believe this rebirth was to reintroduce the outer gods, aka natural cycle of life, back into existence, as the outer gods are physical manifestations of birth, decay, and death. Mikola's attempt to rebirth himself as the one great mirrors his father's rebirth into Merica's mimic as Radagon attempted to become a god. Yet, as Merica stated in her bedchamber, thou art yet to become a god. Radagon's failure may mirror Mikola's as well, as Mikola currently remains in a deep slumber within his cocoon, his plan of rebirth seemingly never coming to fruition. Tezcatlipoca is related to the idea of rebirth as well, as each year a captive was selected to act as the god's avatar, or incarnation, and at the end of each year, this captive was ritualistically sacrificed. The sacrifice symbolically rekindled the divine flame, revitalizing and renewing the god. Yes, Tezcatlipoca's avatar would die during the process, but Tezcatlipoca as a deity was immortal, and thus was reborn from death. Toxkittle took place throughout May and involved a number of rituals that, for the most part, were dedicated to Tezcatlipoca. The ceremony started once the Ishipetla, or live image of the god in the form of a young man, was sacrificed. Tezcatlipoca's Ishipetla was a young man with not a scar on his body. The young man was chosen to be the living image of the god and his representative on earth for the space of a year. His abilities to learn music were remarkable, and during his time as Tezcatlipoca's living image, he was constantly accompanied by eight page boys. Together they would roam the streets of Tenochtitlan at night, playing melancholy tunes on their flutes. Tezcatlipoca was also associated with using a whistle as his instrument. Pages are boys employed as an attendant of a person of rank. Within the lands between, the page hood states that they are worn by those that serve nobility. The unassuming sack-like appearance befits their unseen and unknown stature. High page clothes are exquisitely tailored to avoid any undue shame for their master. Side note, Margot the Fell Omen also uses the term shame when he states the thrones, stained by my curse, such shame I cannot bear. The Omen King is also known as the Veiled Monarch. Veiled meaning to hide one's face. This is due to his omen blood and physical aspects of the Crucible being despised within the Golden Order due to the reminder of creation being possible outside of the Erd Tree. The page's hood also hides their face, and the statue located within the Halig Tree seems to have a face covering as well. Some pages are selected for special privileges by the nobles they serve and are deemed as high pages. High pages wear white hoods, while normal pages wear black, which could represent yin and yang, a balance. Pages drop the red branch short bow, fashioned by a master craftsman, a bow which requires dexterity rather than strength to master. The pages appear smaller, therefore they would have to rely on their dexterity rather than their strength. Mikla connects with the page's smaller stature due to his curse of eternal childhood. Like the pages that accompany the living image of Tezcatlipoca, the pages within the lands between are also found playing a flute. Music 
particularly that of the flute, was the vehicle for all prayer. Aztecs asserted that without the gift of song, they could not commune with their gods, and thus they would be left in turmoil. The sounds of Tezcatlipoca and his pages playing their instruments would at times cause those that had committed murder, thievery, and other transgressions to repent. Music plays a similar role within Elden Ring, as the Oracle Envoys are a monstrous band of musicians who play their pipes to herald the arrival of a new god, while the harp bow, acquired by solving the champion's song painting, states troubadours sing tales of champions, both in honorable service of the Erd Tree and the one who spurns honor for blasphemy. The red branch short bow and harp bow are both light bows. Some characters are tied to certain weapon types, incantations, or spells. I believe smaller weapons, or those built with a masterful design, are connected to Mikola, like light bows, crossbows, and small shields. Again, this is due to his smaller stature, as he was cursed with eternal youth. Another light bow is the composite bow. It is tricky to wield, but is a fearsome tool when mastered. Notice the term fearsome, as it is also used to describe Mikola, as his sister states that he is the most fearsome Empyrean. It is also used to describe the dragon at Ag Heel Lake, fearsome and majestic, but we'll get to dragons in a bit. The composite bow was made from a mix of materials. Composite can be defined as relating to Corinthian architecture, as some armor within the game does mirror armor from the real world Corinthian order. More importantly though, composite means being made up of various parts or a melding of elements. The melding of the composite bow could tie to the melding of gold and silver found throughout the game's narrative. The bow can be purchased from the nomadic merchant located near Bellum Church. Within Bellum Church stands a statue of Radagon. Radagon can be described as being composite as well, a melding of different materials. In part 2, I focused on the melding of red and white, but more obviously there is the melding of gold and silver. This melding is visually displayed through items like the twinge set, high page set, consort's mask, and royal knight helm. Still though, just as the Red King is the sun and the White Queen is the moon, gold is the sun, while silver is the moon, the colors still symbolizing the same union of sun and moon to form the eclipse, which could be viewed as the Philosopher's Stone. Let's return to the Aztecs, as after the year had concluded, the living image was sacrificed to mark the beginning of the spring festivities. His sacrifice would take place without spectators, in a neglected temple far away from the city center. In reported details of the ceremony, it mentions a focus on the living image's hip bone post-sacrifice, given extreme care and wrapped thoroughly with paper by a priest. Others view this wrapping of the hip bone as a ceremonial rebirthing of the god's essence, as the action performed by the priest is akin to wrapping up a newborn baby. The Ishipitla sacrifice was an honorable way to die. Within the Aztec belief system, an ordinary man or woman who died would have to struggle through various layers of underworlds prior to meeting their rest. While a sacrifice, along with men who died in battle and women who died in childbirth, avoid all of that by directly ascending to follow the sun across the sky, their soul manifesting in the form of butterflies and particular birds. The fact that sacrifices were placed on the same status as men who died in battle and women who died in childbirth denotes a connection to all sacrifice being crucial for the preservation of society and continuation of life. Sacrifice for creation is associated with the formless mother, the manifestation of birth. Through birth, bloodlines continue, and heritage is formed. As mentioned, life has become stagnated in the lands between since the removal of destined death. Birth, or rebirth, is a key aspect to the narrative within Elden Ring. With the removal of death, the value of life itself diminished, plus item descriptions explain that some have been chased from their birthplace, a loss of both creation and heritage. Yet life finds a way, as new life continues to grow outside of the Erd Tree's influence, leading to the creations of Albanorics, Snakemen, and Omen. All new creations being deemed as negative through Golden Order skewed item descriptions, Albanorix deemed impure, Snakemen as grotesque, and Omen as accursed. All new life must be created through the Erd Tree's blessings via the power of the Greater Will to be accepted within the Golden Order. The Mother of Truth craves wounds, she craves life as she is Mother Nature, life abundant through sacrifice to form the cycle of life. She is called the Mother of Truth because in truth she is our Mother, Mother to all. Although the lands between have been led astray through the belief that the Erd Tree is the only way of rebirth through the campaigns of the Golden Order. The theme of rebirth is showcased through various reproductive imagery placed throughout Elden Ring's environments as a form of visual reinforcement. The imagery can appear as hip bones or a uterus. Even a new image for the upcoming DLC Shadow of the Erd Tree displays this same imagery as this creature is in the same shape as a uterus. Mikola is tied to this idea of rebirth as well as his cocoon sits atop a giant hip bone. 
Tezcatlipoca was referred to as the wisest of all of his brothers, also being attributed as cunning and meticulous, while in the lands between, Mikola possesses the wisdom of a god, as stated by Melania's quote inscribed on the winged helm, not to mention the connection that Mikola has to owls, like the slumbering egg or engraved owls found on the Elfiel, brace of the Halic tree. Tezcatlipoca is known to dwell everywhere, but at the same time, nowhere. No matter where you look, he has had a role to play in it. Any little thing, or even the most minuscule of acts, is almost always drawn back to him. I believe Mikola mirrors the Aztec god in this way, a silent yet awfully powerful figure. All of Radagon's children share his outstanding characteristics. Radon and Melania, both formidable warriors. Ronnie and Melina, both knowledgeable with sorceries and incantations respectively. Yet, no children seem to connect to Radagon like Mikola, as they both seem to search for a greater purpose, to attain godhood. To learn that Radagon is Merica, you must first give Thops, a scholar of the Rea Lucaria Academy, a key for him to gain entry. In return, he gives the Tarnish the erudition gesture. Erudition meaning the quality of having or showing great knowledge. Thops uses his key to gain entry into an educational institution, which results in the creation of new knowledge, a powerful spell. The gesture allows crystal glintstone crowns to glow to represent the illumination of knowledge, like how a light bulb over the head of a character can be used to display that an idea has been formed. The erudition gesture is necessary when accessing the statue of Radagon to show that he is Merica, as like Thops, you are gaining new knowledge, powerful information within the lands between. The gesture is also necessary for the converted tower in Lernia, converted meaning cause to change in form, character, or function. I believe this is to say that Radagon was once a being separate to Merica that converted into her mimic by his own desire to reach a state of wholeness, albeit converted could also simply mean to cause the statue to change form as it shifts physically from Radagon to Merica. Prior to his transformation, it is possible that he was once a creation of the Crucible. The primordial crucible is similar to what the Aztecs called Teult, which means eternally self-generating and self-regenerating sacred power, energy, or force. The primordial crucible is a melting of ancient energy, and therefore Radagon is essentially an agglomeration of life. His associated symbol being the cross-hatched pattern. It's found on the Scar Seal rune, the Mask of Confidence, the thorns blocking the Erd Tree, the backing of his statues, his connection to tailoring tools, needles, and forging. His sword being the Golden Order Greatsword, reforged from the Moon Greatsword that was given to him before he was absorbed into the Golden Order. His journey to becoming complete is a journey of ascension to godhood. This idea of cross-stitching is why we can see so many characters that mirror Radagon, like Bok, Hugh, or Eiji. All creatures looked down upon within the Golden Order's caste system, all labeled as inferior. Yet these three examples prove otherwise. They all have the ability to speak, it would be naive to think that they were the only individuals of their species to be capable of such a feat. As mentioned in Part 1, on Mount Gelmir, sorcerers are found reading to the Demihumans, proving that those with the qualities of the Crucible are capable of evolution through the power of knowledge. Bach, Hugh, and E.G. are all examples of great intelligence, as they are all master craftsmen, like Radagon and Mikola. Then we have Radagon's similarities to the Knights of Zamor, Yet, I believe this association stems from Radagon's connection to the Newman due to him being Merica's mimic. Brother Corin states that Radagon was Merica herself, or at least such is all that he can interpret from the rhythm and calculus of the gold mask's finger. To me, this highlights the possibility that this statement holds a deeper truth than simply Radagon is Merica. I theorize Radagon to be of the Crucible. This is why he shares so many connections with an assortment of creations like the Demihumans, Misbegotten, Trolls, Giants, and Dragons, as they are all physical representations of primordial life. Radagon is the red-haired champion of the Crucible that merged with the silver science of the Larval Tear and the gold of Marika's Newman hair, as he searched for completion. Radagon therefore embodies the Law of Regression. Regression is the pull of meaning, that all things yearn eternally to converge. Radagon is the merging of both faith and intelligence, gold and silver, sun and moon, beast and Newman. Radagon is the quilt of the lands between, multiple layers of different fabrics, connected via cross-stitching. The rebus is the merging of the Red King Sulphur with the White Queen Mercury, described as the Divine Hermaphrodite, a reconciliation of spirit and matter, a being of both male and female qualities, as indicated by the male and female head within a singular body. It is the end product of the alchemical magnum opus, or great work. In many depictions of the rebus, the figure stands atop a conquered dragon, which could represent your beastly or earthly inner desires that must first be conquered in order to gain a deeper understanding of your true self. Dragons with an Elden Ring represent ancient life, the primordial crucible. The Elden Beast even takes the form of a dragon. 
In the early Middle Ages, the dragon was often associated with the devil, chaos, and evil through the lens of theology. A common medieval trope was the dragon as a nemesis of an angel or saint. Many manuscripts feature stories involving figures like St. George, St. Margaret, and the Archangel Michael facing off against dragons. In the book of Revelation, chapter 12, the prophet John describes a vision of the red dragon. The vision begins with a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of stars. The woman was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. Iron in the lands between is used to craft items used by prisoners, exiles, and those deemed guilty in the eyes of the Golden Order. Iron can be viewed as a symbol of judgment. In psychology, the dragon could represent the outdated concept of the reptilian brain, a primitive brain at one time thought to reside within our own neocortex. It was said to be responsible for instincts like hunger, survival, and mating. Carl Jung referred to dragons in a number of his works. He initially cites it as an arch enemy of the hero archetype. Within some of Jung's works, he views it as the mother dragon, which threatens to overwhelm the birth of God. Thus, the dragon must be defeated before becoming the hero. Jung describes his psyche as a realm which in the dragon stands as the guardian of the treasure. The treasure in this case is the realization of the true self. In many traditions, dragons are seen as embodying the primal forces of nature, creatures that integrate features of various animals, like scales of a snake, wings of a bird, and claws of a lion, to denote a link to all life. The dragon's fearsome and awe-inspiring presence can be interpreted as a metaphor for the confronting nature of the deep inner work needed to realize your true self. Dragons, in their mythological symbolism, represent the formidable journey one must undertake to reach a deeper understanding or enlightenment. Jung explained that the divine curiosity yearns to be born and does not shrink from conflict, suffering, or sin. This curiosity propels us to care for our inner dragon, guiding us closer to the true self and awakening us to a state of wholeness where inner conflicts are resolved and our true essence is fully realized. In this state of unity, the dragon, once a symbol of inner strife, becomes a symbol of our integrated authentic self, embodying the transformative power of embracing all aspects of our being. The aspects of the dragon, scales, wings, claws, can all be used to symbolize the fact that all living things use DNA and that all living things derive from a common ancient ancestor. In Elden Ring, dragons display aspects of the primordial crucible, an ancient melding of life. Radagon is an anagram of a dragon. The red-haired champion is a melding of life, as he continues on his journey for completion. Radagon, prior to his transformation, was of the crucible. This is made evident by his red hair. A sword monument in Lernia states that Radagon's glory burns red as his hair, burning red like the ever-burning forge of the fire giants. The forge relating to the crucible, a place to meld materials together, a place of creation used by the giants and decorated with engravings of dragons. Albeit purely speculation, Radagon could be viewed as the red dragon of Revelation, an ill omen for the end times of the Golden Order mirroring the great beast within the prophet John's vision in the Christian mythos, as the arrival of the second Elden Lord preceded the end of the Golden Order. The last piece of the puzzle is the DLC, which I'm sure will provide an abundance of information that will help us all better understand how Radagon's narrative fits together through a better understanding of Mesmer. Mesmer obviously having the same burning red hair of the Crucible, like Radagon. Mesmer's spear attack appears to strike in a similar fashion to Melania's clean rot knight attack, Melania of course being a daughter of Radagon. Rykard, son of Radagon, turned into a snake and was associated with the lava sorcery of Mount Gelmir. Mesmer appears to have the same affinity for snakes and fire as Rykard. Rykard's queen consort was Tanith. Could the Lands of Shadows be the same location of the Foreign Lands mentioned via the consort's mask, as Tanith was a dancer in a foreign land and the DLC features a dancing sword master with two curved blades? We'll know soon enough. To conclude, I speculate that Radagon's heritage is that of the Crucible, the flame of creation shown through his abilities of embroidery and smithing, abilities of merging different materials together in order to craft something new. His past seems to be told through the journeys of Bok, Hugh, and Eiji, all creatures of the Crucible. 
to become complete, to become a god, he used a larval tear to transform into Merrick the Eternal, in which he succeeded except for his red hair, a reminder of his origin which is why he despised his red locks. During his transformation, the larval tear became part of his genetics, his blood. These genetics were then passed down to his demigod children, thus their emerging of the primordial crucible, the golden hair of the Newman, and the silver science of the larval tear. Thank you very much for joining me on this three-part series. I sincerely appreciate your time, and as always, I hope you all have a wonderful week.